content which language has here acquired is no longer the perverted and perverting and distracted self of the world of culture. On the contrary, it is the spirit that is returned into itself, is certain of itself and certain in itself of its truth or of its own recognition of that truth and which is acknowledged as knowing it. The language of the ethical spirit is law and simple command and complaint, which is more the shedding of a tear about necessity. Moral consciousness, on the other hand, is still dumb, shut up within itself, within its inner life, for there the self does not as yet have an existence. Existence and the self stand as yet only in an external relation to each other. Language, however, only emerges as the middle term mediating between independent and acknowledged self-consciousness and the existent self is immediately universal acknowledgement, an acknowledgement on the part of many and in this manifoldness, a simple acknowledgement. The content of the language of conscience is the self that knows itself as essential being. This alone is what it declares, and this de declaration is the true actuality of the act and the validating of the action. Consciousness declares its conviction. It is in this conviction alone that the action is a duty. Also, it is valid as duty solely through the conviction being declared. For universal self-consciousness is free from the specific action that merely is. What is valid for that self-consciousness is not the action as an existence, but the conviction that it is a duty. And this is made actual in language. To make the deed a reality does not mean here translating its content from the form of purpose or being for self into the form of an abstract reality. It means translating it from the form of immediate self-certainty, which knows its knowledge or being for self to be essential being, into the form of an assurance that consciousness is convinced of its duty and, as conscience, knows in its own mind what duty is. This assurance thus affirms that consciousness is convinced that its conviction is the essence of the matter. Paragraph 653 begins with some contrast between how language is being used at this point of the phenomenology in this morality section near the end of spirit and how it had been used earlier for self-consciousness in some earlier stages of the same massive development of the spirit section. And what we've got going on here before we jump into the text is actually quite interesting to think about. We can say that there's a general complaint that gets made throughout the ages and it goes all the way back to early considerations of language in Western philosophy. For example, in, in Plato's discussions in the Cratylus, and you could say even further in the pre-Socratic philosophers like Parmenides and Heraclitus, but also in those who are examining the poetic texts that are being put forth. I suppose you could say all three of those philosophers are actually uh, not just poets themselves in a certain way, but also anti-poets as well. And so the basic complaint is, is this. Why can't people just say precisely what they mean or precisely what reality is? Why does language, which is this universal medium of exchange, which should say how things truly are, or at least say how they appear to us, or at least express our own true inner selves. Why does language not just conceal, actually here is a great place to bring up the Heraclitian god, the, the god of Delphi, uh, who doesn't simply conceal or hide away, but doesn't simply make clear and manifest, but signals by way of signs, signs that have to then be interpreted. Why can't language be straightforward, like, like, and the idea is like everything else. Now, if we're good 
followers of Hegel at this point, we know that nothing is as straightforward as it appears, right? Everything is subject to the dialectic. Uh, you might say the natural world less so, you know, Hegel's philosophy of nature was, was not a rousing success and, and you know, it, it's rightly set aside at this point in time. But when it comes to the cultural world, the world that we inhabit and the world in which we rise up within, the world in which we actually have culture, building, development, it is the case that nothing is unmediated, nothing is as simple as it seems. You never get something completely straightforward. There's always more to dig into, isn't there? And so Hegel is bringing up something here that we might say is a temptation, a will of the wisp, you know, this thing that's perpetually eluding us, leading us deeper into the forest where we get lost and then it disappears and we're like, wow, how the hell did we get here, right? The idea is that at some point in time, we can all be, as we say in American English, straight shooters, right? We can all express exactly what's going on. And this is, in fact, a dream, a desire, something that we hunger for, but something that's going to turn out to be unavailable. And we can look back from the vantage point of where we've arrived here in the phenomenology at previous uses or invocations of language by Hegel in earlier parts of the development of spirit, this, this entire spirit section, and say, oh, it didn't happen then. And we might think about others as well. We could think back to the unhappy consciousness and all the attempts to use not just language, but ritual and symbology to bridge this gap between the, the unimportant individual and the universal that's way out there. We could think of uh, other uses within the reason section, you know, talking about laws, the law of the heart, reason giving itself laws. None of those actually managed to, to make it all the way through, but they did advance us a bit. And realizing that there's, there's this other stuff going on with language that we saw in the past at points where we thought that language would give us a pure meaning, a uncontroversial way of looking at things, we, we can say, yes, this, this was not exactly what we wanted. R remember, too, that this is going to be brought along. These remain functions of language or possibilities of language especially this language of culture, as we're going to see a little bit later on. But um, we're trying to get past that. So all of that's some, some preamble. Hegel says, the content which language has here acquired, what it is that language can say, it's got a new content, a new inhalt in German, is no longer the perverted and perverting and distracted self of the world of culture, of Bildung, right? And Bildung, by the way, doesn't just mean culture in the sense of like high culture. It also means education, right? It means development. All these attempts that in previous stages, uh, the person, the developing self uh, by opposition to its society, had to try to, to change itself, to make itself into something better. These have become perverted. These are also perverting. That's why there's a reaction against the enlightenment and distracted self, a, a self that winds up going nowhere, you could say, right? There's the, the frenzy that, that comes with this. And we've seen this at several different points as well, right? Uh, this is a, a good place in the narrative of the phenomenology to think about the earlier stages as being kind of enfolded, or if we want to use Hegel's own term, aufgehoben, right? Uh, enfolded in and, and the essential moments preserved. We have this going on in the conscious, uh, the self-consciousness section, right? With skepticism. We have this going on in the reason section. We have this going on in the spirit section. And so we're leaving that part of language behind because now we have a better, we have a better content, 
this, by the way, ought to put us on our guard, right? Because if Hegel's focusing on content here, you know that he's soon going to be talking about the form and how the form is not exactly mapping onto the content. But let's just leave that aside and enjoy uh, our, our little time of peace and rest and optimism for a moment. So we're getting past that. He says, on the contrary, it is the spirit that has returned into itself, is certain of itself, and certain in itself of its truth, or of its own recognition of that truth, and which is acknowledged as knowing it. Isn't that great? You know, all the Hegelian categories, not all of them, of course, but, but quite a few of them are coming together in a harmonious way at this point. Let's look at that line one more time and um, think through its implications. The sp it is the spirit that has returned into itself, right? So there has been a development, there's been a movement. Now it's certain of itself. That's one of the key things that the Hegelian spirit is always looking for, isn't it? Certainty, gewissheit. And certain in itself of its truth. Not only does it have certainty, gewissheit, it also has truth, wahrheit. Can these two be successfully brought together at this point? Now, of course, if you've been traveling along the path of the phenomenology up until this point, you know that the answer is going to be no. <laughs> right? that, that right now we, we have something going on that will um, be, turn out to be a little bit illusory, a little bit of an optimistic projection. But let's follow it along still for, for the moment. So we have, um, it's certain of itself in its truth. And then we have some, a really interesting twist here. Or of its own recognition of that truth. It doesn't just have truth. And this is a very important point. It kind of flies under the radar here. It needs to recognize that as truth, as its truth. And, and we see this term recognition or acknowledgement throughout this, this uh, paragraph and indeed throughout this entire section because that is what spirit as individual beings has been looking for all this time. Recognition of this truth as its truth. He goes on and he says, and which is acknowledged as knowing it. So it's not the truth now or the certainty that's acknowledged. It's the subject, the person who is acknowledged as knowing this truth. And what that means in this case is having a conscience, having a fully developed conscience that it acts in relation to. And in this paragraph, talks and is talked about in relation to. So... We're still not at that, that point of exactly laying out what that is. We have one more contrast to look at. What about the language of ethical spirit? That was earlier, right? That was where we had the invocation of the Antigone and all these discussions about the city or the state and the gods and the individual and all, all that sort of, sort of business. Well, <clears throat> the language of ethical spirit, Zittlichengeist, now remember that, that for Hegel, whatever you may have read in, in Intro to Ethics textbooks about ethics being you know, the study of, of uh, what's right and wrong and morality being just codes, that's exactly the opposite for Hegel, right? Zittlichen, ethical life, is something that is less conscious, less you could say, reflexively agentic, that is able to decide for itself. <clears throat> it's more driving uh, forces that, that are there, and it is being dominated by those and sort of unfolding those within the scope of the individual or the group consciousness. So ethical spirit is where you actually have a society, a civilization, a culture that has roots, a history, and where people arise to situations of power or into moral dilemmas, and it's driven by something outside of themselves, some necessity that places them in there and brings them into conflict. And he talks about three main modes of 
language in that case. One is law, gazettes, right? The, there's the law of the city and the law of the gods or the law of the family. Command, befail, those who have power get to tell other people what to do. And both of them are, you could say, members of, of the spiritual ethical community, right? They may not always follow, <clears throat> but that is, that is one of the possibilities. And then we have complaint. It's interesting that he brings this up because what that means is that there's a pushback. There's, it's not just power and, and language flows from on, to, from on high, from on top, down, and everybody accepts it. Rather, there's, there's a pushback. There's a, yes, okay, fine, I'll do your thing, but... And then uh, Antigone doesn't do what she's supposed to. Or her sister wavers back and forth. It's many about whether she should give in to power or whether she should line herself up with Antigone. And we could go on and on with all sorts of examples of that. Hegel is saying that this is also being left behind <coughs> as well. And now why is it being left behind? So he tells us the language of the ethical spirit is these things. And he says, complaint is more the shedding of a tear about necessity. Moral consciousness, on the other hand, is still dumb, shut up with itself, within its inner life, for there the self does not as yet have an existence. Existence and the self stand as yet only in an external relationship to each other. So there's something that's lacking in development there, however complex it may be, however interesting it may be, there's something that has not yet been attained. And Hegel thinks that this is something that has been attained in modernity, specifically in Western modernity, right? So there's, there's something that has been developed and it has to do with language. So he tells us that language emerges as the middle term. We're going to come back to this in a bit. You notice I've, I've placed it a little bit lower on the board in part because I, I think that what's going on here is, is what's more driving it. And then this is what is actually achieved in it. So let's run through that passage. Language emerges as the middle term, mediating between independent and acknowledged self uh, you, you know, uh, here we go, uh, acknowledge self-consciousness, right? So it's Selfbewusstsein in both cases. And the existence self is immediately universal acknowledgement, an acknowledgement on the part of many, and in this manifoldness, a simple acknowledgement. The content of the language of conscience is the self that knows itself as essential being. That is what the new content is. The self that knows itself as essential being, as you could say, the center of its linguistic and uh, action and duty universe, every single person, and this is why this, for Hegel, has to wait until modernity, right? In modernity, any individual person potentially can become the center of spirit and act according to that, or at least understand itself as such. Doesn't mean that everybody can grab the reins of the state or the rudder of the state, whatever metaphor we want to use, but it does mean that everybody has access to the reflexivity of spirit through language, through the development of, of culture, through having gone through these things. So he goes on and he says, um, the content of language, right? Uh, this alone is what it declares. This alone, the self that knows itself as essential being, this new content is what it declares. And this declaration is, as he says, the true actuality of the act and the validating of the action. Declares could also be expressed as expressing right? or as uh, literally saying, saying outwardly, saying to, to something, uh, not just itself, but it is also for itself, right? So declares, what does it declare? The true actuality of the act the vara wirklichkeit des tuns, and the validating of the action, geltender handlung. We've talked about this before, and actually I just talked about it in the last few paragraphs, that handlung and, and tat or tun are not exactly the same thing. We should think of one as sort of uh, 
occasional or punctual. You do an act, an act, right? And then there is action, which would be composed of of many acts, but would also include sort of the broader, you know, motivation habits that you've developed. We could think of it as <clears throat> as um, not just action. But also as comportment, if, if that helps you think about it in a you know more lasting term. So we have the true actuality of the act, the 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 reality, the wirklichkeit of the act, and then we have the validating, the saying that it does have value or validity of the action itself, and this is what is being declared by the self that knows itself as an essential being. This is very abstract, so what are we talking about here? So in behaving according to, say, some, some moral guideline, like love thy neighbor as thyself, by deciding to make that central in one's own handlung, in one's action, and then actually go, you know, take a casserole over to your neighbor who has had a death in the family and meet them at the door and say, I didn't want you to have to cook. This is kind of a, a custom here in the United States and particularly in the Midwest. When somebody dies, you get fed a lot by your neighbors <laughs> that's, that's, and family. That's just the way it goes. And that can be the expression of self knowing itself as essential being saying i'm a good person this is the right thing to do i'm going to do this and if you can't you know make a casserole well you go and buy a casserole at at you know some deli or something like that and bring it to them now in doing so we have a very particular case that we're looking at but this is looked at by the person who's doing it as a way in which they declare what they're doing they express now he goes on a little bit further and let's get a little bit more complicated here he says that this alone is what it declares and the de declaration is the true actuality the act of validating of the action consciousness declares its conviction überzeugung right it declares what it thinks what it is convinced by, what it, it follows, you know? It's kind of interesting. We use this word conviction as something that you have typically about outside affairs. Like, I, it's my conviction that we need to do something about the many people who are going to be homeless when they're not able to pay their rent in the middle of a pandemic, right? But we can also talk about conviction as inward. And it's interesting that among Protestant Christians of certain types, they will talk about being convicted by, say, the word that they're reading, meaning the, the religious scriptures. And conviction means a sense of responsibility, oftentimes that you haven't met your responsibilities. So in this case, it's not that way. It's a conviction that one is doing the right thing, that one is the bearer of moral rectitude. And so the conviction, he says here, right, the consciousness declares its conviction. He says, it is in this conviction alone that the action is a duty. So it's not that there's some sort of imperious outside norms that come in and say, thou shalt, thou shalt not, or some calculation on a utilitarian basis of, you know, what is to the general benefit of the community and we have to follow that. No, it's the individual who has decided that the action is duty and precisely because they've decided for themselves that they are going to follow these moral norms or make these moral norms valid, the action does become duty, right? The handlung becomes flicked. So it's not that flicked or duty is something outside of ourselves. We discover it and we don't just like look within, and, oh, there it is. There's duty. I better follow this. It's something that we think over and decide on. So, he goes on and he says that it's, it's valid. It's in this conviction alone and the action is a duty. It is, it also, it is valid as duty solely through the conviction being declared. So there is a 
it's not just that you, you decide for yourself and then you go and do the thing. You communicate about it. There is also a sense in which the conviction being expressed allows that action to be duty. So this is very complexly connected, isn't it? And here we should take a little pause and go outside of the text a little bit and think about some of the implications of this. The fact that I'm expressing it means that I am placing it out there in language in this medium that all these other people share, all these other self-consciousnesses. And I cannot actually compel them to see things exactly the way that I do, can I? I'm hoping they do. At this point, I'm assuming they do, because that's how I can say, I'm the good guy here, right? But that's not necessarily going to be the case. So he goes on and he says, universal self-consciousness is free from the specific action that merely is, in this case, bringing the casserole. What is valid for that self-consciousness is not the action as an existence, but the conviction that it is a duty. And this is made actual in language. I bring the casserole to the door of the bereaved person and I say, here you go. I didn't want you, I didn't want you to have to cook for yourself. I'm so sorry for your loss. And then my neighbor is looking at me and my neighbor is like, oh, that's a good guy right there. Now, if I'd handed it to them in silence and just nodded, maybe it wouldn't have the same effect. If I handed it to them and I was like, there you go, right? And I say it in kind of a demeaning way, not the same effect. I'm displaying myself as a good person to the others and thereby to myself in language. So he says, um, to make the deed a reality does not mean here translating its content from the form of purpose or being for self into the form of an abstract reality. It means translating it from the form of immediate self-certainty, which knows its knowledge or being for self to be essential being, into the form of an assurance that consciousness is convinced of its duty. I'm a good person. I'm convinced of my duty, right? And as conscience knows in its own mind what duty is. So I'm not confused about what duty is. And this is where it gets pretty dicey, right? Because there's all sorts of things that people do. And they're like, oh, I was doing this for you. I, I, I'm really trying to help you out. And you're like, you prick. You did exactly the opposite of what I, what I would actually want. Because you never pay attention. And you're, you're giving me something I, I actually don't want. And that's getting in the way of me actually getting something that would be helpful for me. Get the hell out of here, right? That's a possibility for consciousness. But... Conscience doesn't realize this at this point. We're going to see that emerge a little bit later. So he, he concludes by saying that the, the, this assurance affirms that consciousness is convinced that its conviction is the essence of the matter. Now that's very, very formal at this point. So we're going to come back to that in just a sec. But I do want to jump back up to, to the, the part where he's talking about language as a mediating term. So he says language emerges as the middle term Mediating between what? Independent, uh, selbstständiger, right? Uh, Selbstbewusstsein, and acknowledged, honor, counter, Selbstbewusstsein. So it's, it's bringing those two together, which would otherwise be sundered. And the existent self, he says, is immediately universal acknowledgement an acknowledgement on the part of many. That's, that's a long-winded cir circumlocution that Miller is using for just saying uh, it's multifold, it's manifold, it's, it's a manifoltiga, right? And um, it's a feelheit, a, a plurality. And he says that uh, in this manifoldness, a simple acknowledgement, right? So all of this is happening by way of language. Language is the medium that allows us to do this and allows the person, the person of conscience, to convince him or herself in some respect that they're a better person, a simpler person, an acknowledged person. Everybody's with me. Everybody understands me than they actually are. But that is what has been achieved at this point in time, taking us beyond the other uses of language earlier in the spirit section.